Welcome to Electric Evolution Recharge, the podcast that electrifies your mind and sparks change. I'm your host, Liz Allen, and I'm thrilled to have you join us on this electrifying journey. In our Recharge episodes, we dive deeper than we've done before into the realms of innovation, sustainability, and the electrifying future that lies ahead. So join us as we embark on this electrifying adventure. Tune in to recharge your curiosity and let's ignite the electric evolution. I have with me, I've brought back my husband, Richard Allen, Professor Richard Allen, I'm going to say, um, onto the podcast. <laughs> For those that are listening to you, he's just raised an eyebrow at me. Um, because I actually wanted to bring, and I'm going to call him Rich because that's what I call him. So there you go. Welcome back anyway, Rich. Thank you. It's good to be back. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. And it's and we're so far apart, aren't we? You're upstairs. I'm downstairs. It works. It, this is the way it just works, isn't it? So there you go. Yeah, I can hear a funny echo coming up the stairs. <laughs> right. So Rich and I have been married 20 years next month. And it kind of got me thinking about the fact that when, when I first met you, and we met, for those that don't know, we met in a band, Rich, is, Rich was bass player in the band that, that I was in, I was singing in. And, and he worked for the Met Office. Um, they were based in Bracknell. And so, and he then moved from Bracknell to, to Reading University because uh, the Met Office moved down to Exeter. And all of this time since we've been together, we've known each other longer than 20 years anyway, Rich has always been involved in climate change and he's kind of moved through the ranks and become professor, professor of climate science. I heard him speaking at the EV Cafe Partners Day because they invited him to actually attend the, the, the day. And actually it made me realise, because I wanted to just do this little introduction, by the way, it made me realise that more people need to know about what you've got to say because the way that Rich actually explains stuff about climate change is really easy for people to understand. You don't need to be a scientist to understand the way that you put it. And so many people after your presentation, Rich, actually came up to me and you know this, they said how good it was. So I wanted to bring you back up. I wanted to bring you on here with that in mind and I'm going to ask you some questions as well about following on from our first podcast. So you were you were podcast episode number two. He does usually get a word in edgeways, honestly. <laughs> you were podcast episode number two, and it was a really quite a it was quite a nervous time for me then. But I'm a lot more confident than I was when I first started. And we kind of gave a background to what you how you got into. It, you know, kind of into climate science, et cetera, et cetera. What I wanted to do in this podcast episode was actually talk about the work that you've been doing and you have done on the IPCC with the IPCC report. So intergovernmental panel on climate change and, and some other things. So can you just, I will let you speak now, by the way, <laughs> can you just, just give me a little bit of background on what has been happening. What's why did you get involved in the IPCC report in the first place, and and how how was that kind of that was a, it was about three years in the in the making, wasn't it? And what's happened since? Yeah, so the IPCC um, series of assessment reports has been going since about 1990. So, as a student in the 1990s, I, I read some of those reports and that helped me understand the science of climate change uh, much better and then I went on then to actually contribute so over previous assessments I've been a contributing author to various chapters and in the most recent sixth assessment report I was uh, one of the lead authors so I, I helped to lead a, a chapter on uh, global water cycle changes and you know what the IPCC does you, you're not paid for this it's it's kind of a um, an expected um, contribution that you make as a scientist to really assess the best science, the, the, the most up-to-date, most um, rigorous assessment of what we understand about all climate change, so natural and human-caused climate change, what we understand about how things have changed in the deep past, going back 
um, hundreds, thousands and even millions of years, um, how things are changing now and why, um, and then bringing all the science together, all the physics, all the um, observational understanding, all the um, understanding of um, from complex simulations that we make, uh, using them as a kind of a laboratory to test our hypotheses, bringing all that together to make the best kind of projections of what we think is going to be the case in the future under a different bunch of scenarios. So some mm. with very high greenhouse gas emissions, um, some with intermediate, moderate greenhouse gas emissions and others that are more consistent with what was agreed at the climate uh, the Paris Climate Agreement to limit warming below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial conditions and if possible 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial pre -industrial conditions. So you know my work has been kind of feeding you know helping to assess other people's work uh, but as well as that I obviously do my own research my own teaching in climate change. So what's happened since we spoke when, since I brought you on the podcast last, what's happened with global temperatures since since we spoke with regards to everything that's been happening in, in on on our planet? Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to remember how long ago it was we spoke. Maybe it was December two twenty two when we started. Okay, yeah. So I mean, global temperature has been rising as expected from you know what we understand about the fact that we're we're not cutting greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions are actually, have actually been rising or, or not falling anyway and mm -hmm. concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases like methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, they've also been rising and this has continued to have a heating effect on the planet mm -hmm. so we can measure that there's more energy arriving um, and being absorbed by the planet from the sun, sun's rays than is leaving out to space um, through either reflection of the sunlight um, or in infrared emission, so the planet, that's the only way the planet can cool by emitting re infrared thermal radiation to space. So we can, we can see from the observations that there is still more, a huge amount of energy more coming in than leaving, and that's heating the planet. Mm. And what we've seen since 2022 is um, not only the human-caused factors are continuing to heat the planet, but we're also seeing that combining with natural fluctuations like it always does. So we've seen, um, we, we've seen the development of an El Nino phenomena, which is essentially slosh, really slow sloshing about of ocean water. So going on over many years, like two or three, four, five, six years, you get these kind of oscillations in the ocean. And the El Nino was, was actually named um, because it was first discovered by Peruvian fishermen who noticed um, that their catches of sardines was decimated and the ocean water was much warmer than usual so you're not getting that cool kind of nutrient rich water coming to the surface which is good for the sardines so it was named that because it came around christmas time so the christ child el nino mm. and and that that's that's been kind of termed the, the the term for it and it's known now that it's more of a global um phenomena so it's been called the el nino southern oscillation or enso E N S O, um, and that varies between warmth in the tropical East Pacific um, uh, and cooler times, the opposite, which has been termed La Nina. Mm, okay. um, so what we've seen since 2022 is that the global, the temperatures have risen in the Eastern Pacific, and that's added to the the warming effect from rising greenhouse gases. Um, but it, and it's led to record-breaking temperatures in 2023 globally, and that and this has actually been quite surprising for scientists because um, what isn't surprising is the fact that global temperatures are rising, but just how much they have risen. They're now at that 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold above pre-industrial conditions, mm. which isn't directly relevant to the Paris Climate Agreement because that's, that applies to a much longer period. But nevertheless, it shows we're very close mm. to that threshold mm. already. And what's happened is that other parts of the ocean are also showing record heat, like parts of the Atlantic, parts of the North Pacific. So we've seen this global warmth. And of course, as the planet warms, it has associated influences on um, extremes, weather extremes. The El Nino fluctuation additionally disrupts atmospheric wind patterns and moves wet regions 
and dry regions into different places than they normally occupy. So we've seen unusual extremes in heat, in drought, but also in um, intense rainfall and flooding. So a warmer atmosphere is a more thirsty atmosphere, so it's more capable of sapping the moisture from one region and then winds to move that moisture into storm systems, into monsoons and to come out as even heavier rainfall. So we know that El Nino causes these extremes of weather in different locations, but the fact that the planet is warmer now than it would have been without um, the greenhouse gases we've emitted means that when you get hot extremes, when you get dry extremes, when you get wet extremes, they're even more intense. So it's intensifying these extreme weather events. And also, as the heat is taken up in the ocean and as ice melts, um, the sea levels are inexorably rising year on year. So can you just explain? So we've, we've talked about these, these di different events. So kind of we had, we've had heat waves, we've had forest fires, we've had floods what what human activities are actually you know kind of causing or adding to to the climate change can you just explain yeah so the, the the primary factor is emissions of carbon dioxide so essentially we're burning almost all of the the forest matter that's ever existed because a lot of that was in the say the carboniferous period when there are huge swamps and massive um forests and they have been laid down over millions and millions of years to form coal, oil, natural gas. And although those have been created over many, many millions of years, we're now, we have been over the last hundred years, been burning it in, in a kind of geological blink of the eye. So um, we're suddenly emitting all that fossilised carbon into the atmosphere. Um, and that is impeding the ability of the planet to lose its heat to space so we're actually heating the planet as i mentioned before we've got more energy coming in than leaving because we're impeding the flow of energy out to space so that's the the primary driver of climate change but there are other factors as well so agriculture um, using um, fertilizers um, raising cattle the ruminants that, that burp out lots of methane methane is an even more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide that's been rising and it, in, over recent years it's been rising at an even greater rate than, than scientists were expected, so that's another factor. Um, chlorofluorocarbons, they were ozone damaging substances that are being that the Montreal Protocol managed to uh, uh, limit, um, but there are replacements for the chlorofluorocarbons, the hydrochlorofluorocarbons and other things used in refrigerants and aerosol sprays that are also adding to the greenhouse effect. So that's the primary thing, greenhouse gases are heating the planet by Im impeding the planet's ability to lose heat to space. There is actually another factor as well. well. There's two other factors. The other one is land use change. So deforestation, we all hear about deforestation in the Amazon, but it's also going on over parts of Africa, Indonesia, other places. And this is an additional factor that's adding or re reducing the ability for the planet to take up carbon and we're moving that carbon from vegetation in back into the atmosphere so land use change deforestation is is also contributing a bit but it's it's a small it's a small factor compared to um, fossil fuel burning and agricultural emissions and things like that and finally the other factor that's that makes things more confusing is aerosol particle pollution so we all know about the fact of you know breathing in dirty fumes from cars, from factories, um, and this aerosol particles actually have the opposite effect. They reflect sunlight back to space, so um, they're actually reducing the heat coming into the planet. So they have a bit of a cooling effect. But since the 1980s, when many many people who were, were around in that era will remember acid rain and the fact that you could look on the horizon, it was a bit murky. There was lots of this particle pollution over Europe, over North America, and that was having a cooling effect. But since then, it's been cleaned up to quite a big degree by cleaning up factories, um, having emission standards for, for cars, um, vehicles. But so that's actually now, rather than cooling these parts, it's that, that cooling effect's being removed. So it's adding to the heating effect. Whereas 
um, over other regions like India, for example, there still is this big, and parts of Africa, there still is this big cooling effect from aerosols. China, in fact, has, has cleaned up its, its pollution quite a bit. And that, that is, again, adding to this heating, heating factor because we've removed the cooling effect. So those are the main, the main factors. Burning fossil fuels is the primary driver of climate change. Land use change also contributes and emissions of particle pollution also has a confounding influence in cooling in some regions um, and warming in others where you're removing that, uh, when you're cleaning up the pollution. Would you say that the increase has been over the last... Because so, I, I was kind of thinking, you know, is it, is it a kind of a 50-year period where it's suddenly accelerated exponentially? Is, is it that period of time? And if so, what have we been doing that's, that's contributed to that? Yeah, so the, I mean, the last 50 years, so coincidentally, when I've been alive on the planet, has seen the most rapid period of warming recorded in the more recent historical record going back 2000 years. So this is based on instrumental stuff in the last couple of hundred years, tree rings, um, other geochemical evidence. Um, so really rapid warming. And the most current period, the last you know 10 or 20 years, is probably as warm as the previous warm period um, going back 125,000 years um, into the past, when actually sea levels were around five to maybe even seven metres higher than they are today. Wow. So what we've been doing is just continuing to burn fossil fuels, but burn it at an ever greater rate, mm. partly because we're, our need for energy, our need for this, this cheap supply of energy has rapidly increased, partly because population is exponentially rising. Um, in fact, it would have increased more, but obviously technology has improved efficiency and things like that. Um, and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would have been much, much higher than it was today if it weren't for the, the fact that um, about half of the emissions that we make are actually taken up by the oceans and the land. So without that, the carbon dioxide levels would be even higher in, in the atmosphere. So over the last 50 years, we've simply been continuing more of the same, but the population's been growing, we've been, um, our lifestyle has needed or, or th thinks it needs more and more uh, energy. Um, and that's what's causing the problem. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it kind of informs what's needed to be done for the future. So what, what will happen if we actually don't do anything about this? Well, I mean, that's a very hypothetical question because we are doing a hell of a lot already, mm. even though it doesn't appear that way sometimes. <laughs> um, but if we weren't doing anything about it, then greenhouse gas emissions would continue to rise. Um, they've risen, say, from about 300 parts per million to 420 parts per million in about the last 100 years. And they'll just continue rising at that rate and even faster. So we're going up maybe two or three parts per million every year. That rate of rise would increase even further um, and um, that would cause a very large change in temperatures so if you went back 20,000 years that was the last glacial maximum so ice sheets were moving across northern Britain the world was about five or maybe six degrees celsius colder than it is today if we did nothing if we, if we hadn't done anything and we would carried on just burning all the fossil fuels then we could expect temperature rises of well over three or four degrees C, so almost the same magnitude as going back to that completely different climate 20,000 years ago. Um, what we're on course for now is something of the order of two or three degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, which is, um, it could be more than that if knock-on effects amplify things more than we think they will, but that degree of climate change will then lead to extremely dangerous and damaging consequences much, much larger than we're already seeing, even though we're seeing serious extreme events across the globe, that's going to be the tip of the iceberg if we just carry on our current trajectory. So what we need to do is completely change our trajectory or, or, or be more, much more ambitious in our uh, move of society away from burning fossil fuels, um, away from this need for so much energy usage to a more efficient, more um, equitable society and more in tune with nature 
um, a society that's more in tune with the ecosystems upon which we all depend. Because, uh, because if we don't, there's going to be a big impact, not just on humans, isn't there? You know, it, it, it's going to be on animals, it's going to be on crops and all sorts of things like that. Have you got any, any thoughts about where that would take us if if that happened what would what would we look like as a race yeah well i mean humans will probably always survive but you know we we don't want to just survive we want to thrive and have a equitable and just society and hopefully live in peace and and have have a um you know a good link back to the biodiversity which we all rely on so mm-hmm. yeah as you mentioned, climate change is going to impact ecosystems, animals and plants that can't migrate rapidly enough mm. um, as climate changes. Or maybe there's nowhere for them to go. For example, in the Arctic, um, if, that, if the Arctic ice disappears in the summer, then that might mean some species won't be able to survive. Um, mountains, as, as the temperatures rise, they can't go animals or plants can't go any higher as the mm, as the temperature mm. the, 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 the temperature level goes up in altitude so and humans are inextricably linked to the, the ecosystems we, we depend upon the ecosystems to as, as a kind of service to us all um, we, we think we think of it as you know that just happens but of course um, it happens when things are in balance but when we're pushing things out of balance which we're doing by emitting all this extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere then that can cause uh, tipping points and, and situations where you, you do have species loss and that has knock-on effects for other species and then ultimately for human societies. So what about the people who um, who think that they're just one person and what they're doing doesn't matter? what what can because we all need to be doing something don't we but what what does what does that mean like i say that there's all there's lots of people out there that might not even get to listen to this or watch it and but hopefully we'll can re- this will reach more more people but what does everybody need to what do people need to be doing to actually mitigate this full stop yeah so uh, i mean there, there's a phrase that, that, that's, that's that's used sometimes if we all do a little bit we'll achieve a little bit mm-hmm. everyone needs to do a lot now we all can do a lot ourselves but individuals are limited in their in their power as you as you kind of mentioned so what it mm-hmm. does need is kind of joined up thinking at higher levels that um, everyone gets the help that they need to transition to a much more energy efficient, um, a much lower carbon emission um, society and a more equitable society as well. So what we do need is, is governments to put in the frameworks that make it easy for companies, businesses, for um, you know, cities, towns, councils, for universities, I'm at the University of Reading, for example, which is is doing a lot to get to net zero. But, you know, that that still relies on, you know, funding um, to help it achieve that. So then it comes down to smaller groups working together to achieve um, tangible aims locally and individuals. So individuals in, in, uh, say, the UK, for example, the the biggest um, emissions tend to be actually flying, Um, even though aviation isn't the biggest greenhouse gas emission globally because in rich societies we have got used to flying off for meetings flying off for holidays flying is actually the biggest contributor individually to global warming essentially um but of course driving tra- transport has a has a very big effect you know it's it's about um it's over 20% of the green any energy based greenhouse gas emissions um so Moving towards electric vehicles is obviously one way, but it's not the only way because you've got to actually reduce the amount that we travel, cut out unnecessary travel, mm. make journeys by train where you can. Say I, I go to Western Europe by train. It's 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 good. It, it takes more time, but you know, the, the journey is part of the of the of you know the experience, isn't it? 
Um, and other things, so diet is very important because I've already mentioned that ruminants, so animals like cattle, cows, um, sheep that um, have the, certain digestive tracts, they, they, they incompletely um, metabolise the, um, the carbon and so they bur burp out methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, eating beef and, and lamb is, is pretty bad for the planet. So going towards a plant-based diet is another mm -hmm. really good thing you can do to uh, do individually. And then of course you come down to other factors that like, you know, how do you heat your home? How, you know, can you um, use renew renewable energy in your own home? For example, heat pumps, um, solar panels and batteries. Um, and how can you reduce your energy usage? So how can you insulate your house better better windows, better insulation in your loft, uh, thinking about where there are leaky parts of your house. So all these kind of things you can do individually. But as I say, you need that kind of framework to help you do this. You need the funding to be able to do it. You need to make it so it's not just the rich people can say, oh, yeah, I've, I'll go off and buy an electric car and load of solar panels. You need everyone to be able to have this. You need it to be equitable. And, and that's why you need the framework from say, government and, and other institutions to help society transition. Because if we talk a little bit now about, about the kind of the FUD, the, the fear, uncertainty and, and doubt that's out there, do you, um, do you feel that that's still having an impact on what, how people are seeing, you know, perceiving climate change and the move? I mean, obviously, we've moved to an electric vehicle which has been brilliant, uh, you know, but there's there's all this negativity. You you experienced negativity so much earlier than kind of you know the electric vehicle industry or sector is 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 experiencing it now. But I remember we talked about this before on on the previous podcast. You experienced massive amounts of negativity and kind of climate skeptics. Do you feel that that is, is still the case? Are people still thinking that it's not their problem? Yes, yeah, a really good point, because, I mean, going back in the early 2000s and, and before, there was a lot of, you know, the climate sceptics had a really big voice and media helped them because they, they like to have this kind of balance or a false balance on, on, on these shows. So even if all, all the, you know, the overwhelming scientific evidence show that you know, humans were causing climate change and we need to do something about it, they'd still, you know, they'd put you on as a scientist and put you up against some fossil fuel kind of lobby group or something like that, as if as if it was a fair, you know, discussion that, you know, one of these is right, we're not sure who, but it, so that, that was more the case then. I think um, it's got better, but on the other hand, other aspects of media have got more challenging. So... The, the move towards you know mass social media has kind of polarized society i think that the, you're polarizing the people and people are in their own echo chambers always hearing the same opinions back at them mm. um and so it kind of strengthens their views it's a very natural factor for humans to through confirmation bias to always try and if they they form an opinion to always you know take in the information that agrees with that opinion it takes quite a lot to change your mind and I think social media is really not helping with that. It's polarising things. So we do see large parts of the media that are probably dominated by fossil fuel interests, I, I, I expect, that are fueling some of the this this FUD, this fear. What, what does it stand for again, FUD? Fear, uncertainty and doubt. The fear, uncertainty and doubt, yeah. So I think there's a lot of that going on. Um, and um, so although the mainstream media, I think, has been has, has improved a lot, the social media is, is, is becoming more of a challenge and it's feeding those small but powerful voices that are funded by um, an in, a self-interest in, in the fossil fuel industry. I was just about to say that it's all about, to me, it's, it's about vested interests, isn't it? You know, if, you, if you've got people who've got this vested interests who are currently making billions for their shareholders, then really move the move to away from fossil fuels 
it's going to be massive for them, isn't it? But actually, in some ways, my thinking is that there's going to there's lots of innovation that's coming out of this. There's lots of innovation that's coming out of this time. So actually, in my mind, they need to be looking at that innovation and sort of bringing that bringing that into what what they're doing. Do you agree? I always agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we're on here doesn't mean you have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I do agree. I mean, it, it is amazing to see the, the technolo technological innovation going on. And in, in some way, well, in many, in many ways, um, companies, um, universities, councils are actually by far leading the way over governments because governments are obviously, there's no point in them having these great policies if they don't get elected. And... Yeah. They've always got to be careful that they don't say things that could mean that they they lose voters. And it's a really difficult thing. So mm -hmm. this five year cycle of dem democratic cycle in this country, for example, you know, it, it constantly means that the the um, governments and oppositions are kind of hamstrung in the way that they they can say what they want to say or, or in, bring in the policies that are needed. So. In some ways, they're behind some of the innovative companies that are bringing in new technologies in. They're working to their own net zero agenda and they're doing it and making the companies better. And a case in point as well is, is the where I work, the University of Reading. We've got a huge um, amount of work going on in in trying to become more sustainable. And partly that's a, a money, a financial thing. Universities are having difficulty in finances and, and heating mm -hmm. is a huge thing. So you do want to move for financial, for economic reasons to, you know, heat your um, and, and supply energy and electricity to your company or um, in a more efficient way. But also we want to be doing it because something companies and, you know, want to be seen as, as leaders as well. And they want to be showing that yeah, we can get to net zero by making these step by step, but substantial changes. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, um, University of Reading has identified that business travel is, is a very big greenhouse gas emitter and it's putting in place carbon budgets for staff. And, you know, some some staff, it's more difficult than others because they have projects that are more involved in, in traveling. Um, and we've got teaching that, that goes on in other campuses around, you know, we've got a Malaysia campus, for example, but we've also got links with China. So newest um, campus uh, in Nanjing. So um, you, know, you need to protect younger, earlier career scientists who do need to build up these networks. But the rest of us recognise that we, we don't need to always travel to meetings. And if we want to travel to a meeting in, in Europe, we can get there by train. No problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or a bit of trouble problem if if your train gets cancelled because of flooding, which affected me one time down it did, didn't going it? down to Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> which was which was always it's always very interesting when you go on these journeys, isn't it? And you try alternative methods of transport. But I mean, what you're saying, it, it's it's so true. I mean, Reading Uni is doing, a, 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 and I know a lot of other unis and a lot of organisations are doing a lot to try and implement. Like you said, the car carbon budget. I mean, you know, I've, I, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but before lockdown, you did used to fly quite a lot, which I know, I remember I, we talked about this and I always thought it was a bit hypocritical of scientists flying. And I get it. I, I do get why you needed to, but at least there's that recognition within the scientific community now because of, you know, IPCC and, you know, kind of the kind of um, all climate change as a whole things are a bit different now aren't they yeah and i mean over the last 10 years i i, I kind of has basically ramped down my flights yeah. i appreciated it it was completely hypo hypocritical um some scientists do not fly at all and mm -hmm. i completely respect that i i flew for example for um a couple of the intergovernmental panel on climate change meetings because I, I thought well this is important enough to warrant that but other some scientists would would disagree with that as well um but yeah i, I think um people you know working as as, as climate scientists are, are recognizing have recognized this fact for a long time and now are now mm. um, limiting that but you know that's that's quite a small fry thing when you compare to the wholesale societal changes that are needed and are underway already in terms of yeah. transforming electricity generation, um, 
changing agriculture, um, altering the way um, we heat, heat um, and power industry, heat and power homes, um, and the way we, we feed, you know, we, we, the, the diets that we have. So all these things are underway and, and we need to do it all across all sectors mm. um, to meet what is demanded by the Paris Climate Agreement, which is limiting climate change to below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial and which we're heading towards um, and we will need to ramp up massively the, um, the policies um, across different countries. Um, and that's part of the IPCC process that it actually brings in all these countries. So I was involved in agreeing line by line the summary for policymakers and there are over 150 delegates from each country um, were there to agree line by line all, all of this. So they've actually got buy-in to this process. They, they've agreed and in some cases have, have argued for slight alterations and meanings of, of lines. Um, but they've bought into this and that they are acting on it. But that ambition needs to ramp up massively. But it's also about taking what you, the scientists, have said, right, these are the important things that we need to, you know, this is what's happening, this is how we need to mitigate it. But then it's about industry and se different sectors, isn't it? It's about the filtering down and disseminating that down into, you know, kind of um, everything that each individual sector needs to do. All the, you know, like I say, going back to what I said about people who, who don't think it's not in my backyard, you know, we... We know, we've had conversations about this, about somebody recently who kind of, I think, uh, sees it not necessarily as, 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 as their, their problem. Um, but I, I, it can't not be our problem because we've got, so we've got an 18 year old son um, who's gonna go to university and in years to come, he will probably have a family or whatever. You know, this is about, us doing things for the future isn't it i'm not just trying to be talk you know i'm not talking rubbish here this is this is you know we we have to look at future generations don't we yeah i mean i i'm i'm not the expert in in how you know the innovation of technology and mm. in the policy of how we move forward in time but the science is clear mm. um we know that climate has always changed. We've done huge amounts of work on that. We know that. And we know for a fact that the changes that we're seeing in climate are well outside natural variations over, um, for example, we can look back in ice cores over the past nearly million years and mm -hmm. carbon dioxide levels are well outside of that, those natural changes. The temperatures are well outside and what we experience. The rate of warming, as we mentioned, is, is much much higher than we've seen in, in many thousands of years. Um, the degree of warming is, is unprecedented. And we put all our physics, all our understanding into complex simulations. We bring other evidence in and all these lines of evidence show that the, the, the overwhelming number one factor for that warming is greenhouse gas emissions, particularly carbon dioxide. And we know for a fact that um, Continued emissions of greenhouse gases at the levels we're doing will lead to dangerous climate change, much, much beyond what we, we're seeing now. And what that will mean is when we get wet extremes, there'll be even more intense, even more flooding associated with the, the very, very wet events. Mm. Um, when we get droughts and heat waves, they'll be even more intense. And we're seeing wildfires over the last few years. There's one raging in Chile at the moment. Um, we know that when, when we get the wildfire conditions, which is hot, dry, windy, um, we know that in a warmer world that will be even more severe. And the other thing, going back to your, what you say about future generations, our children and our children's children, it's a really long term problem because um, the amount of time it takes to, to melt these giant ice sheets like on Greenland, like on um, Antarctica, is hundreds and even thousands of years. And all that water slowly finds its way into the oceans. And the ocean, the deep ocean, it takes hundreds of years for that to even notice what's going on at the surface mm. and heat up and expand in volume. Both these factors, but particularly the ice melt, 
is raising sea levels. And sea levels will continue rising for many hundreds of years and possibly even thousands of years. And we're looking at over the next hundred years, maybe up to a metre of sea level rise if we, mm. if we don't do too much about it. But we're looking in the very long term over the next few hundred years of many metres of sea level rise. Mm. And given that large cities, um, many large cities are below that level, we will, whatever, have to make huge changes in the future. But over very long periods, human societies can adapt to climate change. But what we can't do is adapt to very rapid changes. And that's why we need rapid, um, massive and sustained cuts in greenhouse gases. Mm. Because if we, if we delay things, we, we're kind of essentially... Um, putting more and more, keeping all that carbon going into the atmosphere and we're uh, keeping the, the problem very much uh, uh, growing. So we need to rapidly cut that. Um, and by delaying, we're causing a huge economic problem for ourselves. Mm. So that's why the science is clear. We need to rapidly and massively in, in a sustained way cut greenhouse gases. We need to do it in a way that's sympathetic to nature, to the biodiversity crisis, and we need to do it in a way that's equ equitable and just across society yeah. so that yeah. all sectors of society are able to benefit from, from what will be a, a, a better society once we do make these transitions. And everybody needs to be involved, not just, not just the privileged few. You know, like you say, it needs to be equitable so that every, everybody can, can do, do something rather than just sitting back and saying, it ain't my problem, it's not my problem, it's not in my backyard, that kind of stuff, because that's what people tend to do, don't they? Yeah. You know, if it's, not, if it's not affecting them straight away or it's not affecting their pocket, then, then that's, that's what, that's what people, people tend to think. I wanted to finish off by just... Um, because we've been very lucky since since we start when I, since I started this podcast uh, in the fact that we've actually been able to um, have solar panels and battery storage installed, even though we did have a little bit of a problem to start off with it, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> and we've also got we've also bought an electric vehicle, which of course because your active travel. Um, you, and you either cycle or get the bus or get the train. It's and because of the work that I do, it's mostly me that uses that. But but how do you feel it's benefited us? I mean, it's it, you know, as as a as a family, what would you say? Well, I, th I think you know, like you say, we're privileged. We we mm -hmm. we were able to trade our car in for a second-hand electric vehicle, not top of the range, but you know, it works for us well. I think. Yeah. Um, and it's actually a lot cheaper to run because we can charge it overnight on a really cheap tariff. It's hugely cheaper if you can if you can do it that way than running a, a normal petrol or diesel car. Um, we were luckily we had a bit of money in our overpayment fund for the mortgage, so we used that to um, purchase a, some solar panels and a battery, and that's helped by you know the fact that we don't over a lot of the year we don't really use electricity other than what what we get from the sun um so we're lucky in doing that but what we do need to do more work on is um heating by gas we've still got we we want to get rid of that if we um as soon as we can but our house is a bit leaky so we need to better insulate it so that's something we can do and the other thing is consuming we're all used to we want this particular item now regardless of where it's coming from or from around the world we want this um, piece of food from you know this country um, at this time Korea. of year. Yeah. We, we so we need to kind of go back a bit to what we maybe used to do in in consume less um, in terms of energy, in terms of products that we don't really need. Um, consume more efficiently. Um, so you know we we need to kind of reduce um, demand as well as um, you know reduce the kind of um, as well as increase energy efficiency and it has to me um obviously i think that you're obsessed with the apps but that's my <laughs> we've got various apps for various things that i just leave you to get on with because you know that's fine by me but um but i think it it makes this stuff you know so it's, i think um 
over the last six months, there's a lot of change happened in our house and probably since I started the podcast as well. And the other thing, and, and you know, that, so I've been on Anne Snelson's um, carbon literacy course that we went on in uh, me and my, both me and my, myself and Michelle, who works with me, we went on it. And I think actually, like you've just said, it's had me thinking about the things that we are buying, you know, and, and I think, you know, because we get an online shop from Morrison's and... And yes, I knew that I should have been looking, but it wasn't until, you know, obviously you and Anne and kind of just looking at where things are coming from. And you don't always know until you get them delivered. It doesn't always tell you the place of origin, you know, so I didn't know my blueberries were coming from Peru. Well, well I, mean, I think that's an important point that we do need clearer information to help us. Like It's like I said before, we all need a framework so governments can help, but also companies and innovation can help in making it clearer to us which products are high emission and you know maybe a traffic light system or something that started mm. to be incorporated in some in some sectors so these kind of things are i mm. think you know can really help us yeah I, I agree i think if if there was some information that said what the carbon footprint of this thing was you know i mean obviously i know that they don't supermarkets especially don't always know where they're going to be getting something from but most of the time they they must be looking ahead at you know at things but I mean you know when I was young we didn't get blueberries coming from Peru we didn't get you know there was so many things that we just we just had local produce and I'm not just I'm not saying you know I'm not saying that's how everything can be but I just think there's a there's a lot of stuff that that we can do and it's 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 got me thinking um and I still will and I still am and I'm still going to do silly things like maybe buying something from Amazon because I'm having a bit of a panic you know but I'm trying I am trying I'd love to know from anybody watching and listening to this what you, what you're trying to do to actually make a difference I'm I'm not going to be perfect Rich might think he is. <laughs> Most of the time you are, aren't you? <laughs> you know that's not true. <laughs> I'm only joking. But but there's there's there are lots lots of stuff that we can do. But look, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to join me again on this. Cause I th and I, th I think actually you again have provided my listeners and, and people viewing, you know, that a lot of really really useful information so where can people find you rich where if they're if they're looking to get in contact with you if they you do a lot of external outreach don't you so you do outreach with schools and things like this and businesses where's the best place to find you i do a bit yeah um yeah it's probably best to google richard allen a double l a n klein yeah. it um I'm, I'm at the University of Reading in the Department of Meteorology, so I've got a website there. You can find details. Um, yeah, I'm on. You po you're posting on LinkedIn a bit as well now, aren't you? And bit, you're on yeah. Twitter. Yeah, you're I'm, on Twitter. I'm not the I'm not the best at social media. I I, I begrudgingly do a bit. I, I find some <laughs> useful information on there. So, so if anybody is listening and watching, and you want to get hold of him, then then yeah, just search for Richard Allen with an A-N and, and yeah, and actually there's, there's lots of stuff that, that um, you provided us, us with today. I think it's really been beneficial for people. So, so thank you, Rich. Thank you ever so much for joining me. No worries. Good to talk. <laughs> Cause we're so far away, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> so to everybody else listening and watching, thank you ever so much for your time and I will see you next time. Bye. Thank you for watching Electric Evolution Recharge. I hope we've sparked your curiosity and inspired you to make positive changes. I'm Liz Allen and I'm looking forward to sharing the journey with you. So until next time, bye.